moving now to our final guests, uh, which have, uh, is like going to end our uh, forum for this day. Uh, we have the pleasure of having here live at the hotel studio uh, two representatives from uh, the European Bank for uh, Reconstruction uh, and Development. Uh, we have together <coughs> here with us uh, Maya Henrikes. Uh, Maya Henrikes is uh, the um, uh, ESG lead for financial intermediaries uh, for the um, Environment Sustainability Department at the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. And uh, we also have Dimitris Podikakos, an analyst at the Green Economy Financing Facility, or GEF, at uh, the Climate Change and Energy Efficiency Department of the uh, EBRD. Uh, I would like to thank them both for uh, coming uh, live uh, at uh, this uh, event. And we're going to have uh, a one hour session with them. Uh, we're going to first hear them uh, what they have to say about uh, their, uh, their business, how they uh, do. Uh, uh, the uh, sustainable finance and banking uh, in uh, EBRD, how they support uh, uh, economies of operation, like Greece, for example, and where they're looking uh, in their investments. Um, let me state, uh, they also going to say that, that uh, EBRD is one of the largest investors in the country. Uh, they've been together with us for some years now, and hopefully for some more. Uh, but uh, it's tough when they uh, make investments and they make sure they include now environmental and social and governance criteria into their investment decision making process. So uh, without any further ado, I would like uh, to give uh, uh, the floor to these uh, two executives and then we have a short discussion with them and that's how we're going to finish uh, the, this day sustainability forum. So the floor start with the ladies, the, the floor is the first to Maya. Maya. Yeah, thanks very much, Michael. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, as you said correctly, we've been investing heavily in Greece since 2015, so it's an important partner for us and it's always great to come here. Um, we would like to show you a little bit, yes, how we um, do a full ESG integration ourselves, but also how we're, uh, not only for our own investments, we're also attempting to play it forward, so to speak, and, and green the financial systems in the countries that we work with. And just to give you a first overview how we do that, we have, I think, a very comprehensive impact approach, um, which is both on the sort of positive impact side. So we have given ourselves very ambitious goals um, to, for example, increase our um, the share of our financing um, to 50% to be green by 2025. And uh, Dimitris will um, go into the details of that. Um, we also have other strategies that are very important for us. Um, so, for example, uh, gender equality and econ economic e inclusion. We have a strategy for digitalization um, and so on and forward. So this is really positive impact goals where we're trying to be ambitious and take investment decisions um, into those sectors where we feel the impact can be greatest. And then there's the other side, um, which is a little bit more my area. So I will talk a bit more about that. Um, we also do a very rigorous environmental and social risk management, and that's based on our environmental social policy. Um, it has just been updated last year. We update our ESG policy every five years because things improve or get worse, but things move on and things evolve. And we always want to make sure that our policy stays relevant. And um, yeah, we'll show you a little bit about that. But first of all, I think, uh, Dimitris, you can tell us a bit more about the... Um, the positive impact approach where we're trying to be really green when we invest. Okay. First of all, I would like to uh, thank you to Michael for inviting us here. It's a great opportunity for us to present our work and showcase what we do in Greece. Uh, I would like to add also that this, uh, the timing of this uh, forum is, is very critical. We just had our annual meeting uh, the last two days. Uh, our shareholders approved our new strategy. We have a new president, first time woman president in EBRD. Yes, indeed. Uh, Ms. Odile Renault Basso. So great things happening in, uh, at EBRD. And also we have finally the new strategy approved, the, the, the GET 2.1. GET stands for Green Economy Transition. You can see here the timeline. It started uh, this effort from 1994. Uh, and now and up to last year, we had 35 billion in 2000 green projects. And this is a very, very big number, considering that we uh, managed to have 46 of our portfolio, annual business invest investment, dedicated to green projects. I think this 
number was uh, more than uh, anticipated and sets very high expectations for the future. For the next five years, our target is to have more than half of our portfolio, more than 50% dedicated to green, but also help the transition to green and develop uh, low carbon strategies for our uh, partner countries, uh, countries of operations and partner financial institutions. Uh, I will move on to present a bit the core components of this new strategy. So we have three core components. Uh, we have policy engagement, which has always been a driver for change. Especially in the financial system, there is a, a huge amount of initiatives and policy initiatives happening right now. We're talking about uh, regulatory frameworks, like uh, the recommendations from the NGFS, the Network for Green in the Financial System. Uh, we have also uh, the voluntary standards uh, for uh, the bonds, the green bonds, the, uh, climate bonds initiative, uh, green bonds principles, and also TCFT recommendations. And uh, there's a lot of movement in creating uh, networks, networks of financial institutions. We have the UNEPFI, we have the CAFI, the Climate Action in Financial Institutions. Uh, there's a lot of efforts being done to develop synergies with, uh, uh, within the financial sector to share knowledge, share best practices, and uh, help this transition to a greener economy. Now, after, apart from policy engagement, we also have uh, in our agenda, uh, it's a hot topic right now, Paris alignment. What do we mean by Paris alignment? We have all the MDBs have jointly been working uh, as a group to develop uh, a methodology to assess their portfolios in terms of uh, alignment to the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement, of course, we know it has very specific targets of keeping, of keeping uh, temperature levels below two degree rise uh, and uh, net zero emissions until 2050, very ambitious targets. We heard also from the previous speaker that maybe not realistic, but in any case, our work here is to see our financial flows, see our portfolio and real, uh, assess where does this money go? Does it help our countries of operation to mitigate uh, the impact of climate change uh, to reach their goals. And it's a very lengthy exercise. We have started with our direct port direct finance portfolio. We'll move on to the intermediate finance. And in three or four years time, we will estimate that we'll have a full picture of how much of our business is uh, aligned, uh, Paris aligned. And lastly, I wanted to focus on the, the work we do every day. Uh, Not yet, sorry. Not yet, sorry. It's, uh, <laughs> It's a lot of information in this slide, so I'll take a few more minutes and Please. just present this. We have eight thematic areas. And uh, as I mentioned, green in the financial system is one of the most important ones, but uh, also decarbonization, industrial decarbonization, uh, cities, developing uh, green city frameworks. Uh, we already have the green cities platform, a very successful product. Um, Another area of focus will be buildings, natural capital, uh, uh, I forget to look, I have to look at my notes, it's all very new also for me, so I don't want to forget everything, uh, anything. Industrial decarbonization and uh, sustainable connectivity, so transport, etc. And on top of that we have four cross-cutting themes, energy efficiency, uh, it's always a very important aspect of what we do. How can we improve further uh, the efficiency of uh, the industry and uh, the SMEs or even households? Uh, climate resilience, climate adaptation. How we can help the, our countries face the heat stress, water stress. They're all very, very vulnerable countries. And uh, two more themes is just transition as well as uh, digital enablers. Digitalization is uh, another buzzword of the year. Yeah, and we're gonna show some examples, right? Exactly. In this little while. So now we can move on to the next slide. And uh, yes, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have this uh, mandate uh, to scale up green finance. 
and do so in a way that uh, we leave no one behind. Uh, as you know, in Greece, we're going to be phasing out coal. People are be, will have to create new green jobs for the people that will be losing their jobs from this industry. So this is part of our mandate, just transition, also include uh, gender responsive uh, instruments to do so. Uh, we have to scale up concessional co-financing from uh, our support, uh, our uh, uh, climate funds that support our work, so like the Green Climate Fund, uh, the Global Environment uh, Fund, uh, uh, Climate Investment Fund, and of course the EU. And uh, we have to continue to build partnerships with other MDBs to, to make sure that the recovery from this catastrophic pandemic is a green recovery. Building back better, no? Exactly. That's the idea. And oh, Maya, off to you now. Yeah, and um, so I want to show you a little bit how we, when we invest, make sure ourselves that our investments are fully uh, ESG proof, so to speak. Um, I will not speak too long um, on this particular slide because if you were lucky uh, as I was to, to join this forum last year, um, you may remember that I presented those quite extensively last year. Um, so we have our environmental social policy, which I um, showed you in the beginning, which we updated last year, and we still have maintained the same framework, so to speak. We have um, 10 performance requirements, which are the pillars of our environmental social um, work uh, from assessment all the way through. We go about it in 10 themes. You can see them here on this slide. Uh, you will also find they are really the main um, themes that our society struggles with. And I think we've heard a lot about many of those themes also today in the, in the scope of this uh, conference. Now, obviously, um, health and safety is now becoming a big issue with the pandemic. Um, but everything else, we need to make sure that uh, we heard a lot about climate, but we need to also make sure that we look at environmental challenges a bit more broadly. Um, there's other environmental impacts that go beyond uh, climate change. And of course, there's also social impacts that we need to uh, address. And our sort of guiding principle is what we call the mitigation hierarchy. Um, it means that whenever we invest, um, we, may, we want to make absolutely sure that the first point of reference is to try to avoid negative impacts at all costs. And then where those can't be avoided completely, what we're trying to do is minimize them to make them obviously as little as possible. Those that are still remaining, because if you invest, if you build large infrastructure, etc., there is always some impacts. It's not possible to do a zero impact project, right? So if what's ever left after minimization, we attempt to mitigate it um, with measures that go through the 10 performance standards as you've just seen them. And then the very last bit, which really we try to keep as tiny as possible, is then compensation, um, where we can look at things like set-offs, etc. And just to show you a little bit how this works in practice, this is really how we do it um, on a deal-by-deal -deal basis. And it's also not only the way we do it, it's also what we bring to our clients. When we, for example, invest in a financial institution, we will ask them, to take on the same kind of framework and do it in the same way for their own investments, or specifically, of course, also for the investments um, with, our, with our EBRD money. So this is a little bit, we call it, it's an environmental and social management system. That's everything um, that packages together the different steps. And I always say it's a bit like marriage, yeah? It's, <laughs> you start off with a policy, yeah? You have certain ideas, certain convictions, and you tell them to your potential partner, yeah? You meet somebody and you say, okay, for me, it's really important, um, I don't know, uh, ethics and integrity. And obviously, I want you to be green, and I really need you to be social. And these are sort of your high-level um, values that you have that you obviously put in your policy. And then... Um, you do due diligence, right? Same thing as in marriage. So you find your partner, you're probably easily happy with the physical assets, but then you need to check the non-physical assets because it's just as important. So you want to look at how do they work? How do they operate? What do they do? What are their procedures? What are their concepts, yeah? Um, same thing um, for due diligence. So you look exactly at how things work and then you have a conversation. You find out, okay, I don't quite like this. Can we change it? This is really good. Can we expand it? And then you come to an agreement what's kind of acceptable to both parties, right? Um, the way we do it, we look very closely at procedures, um, how, for example, a financial institution 
um, identifies environmental risks, identifies social risks in their, uh, in their own investment activity, and that's also what we do for ourselves, right? And then um, you will always find some gaps. It's normal because we have high standards. Um, the person you meet always has some gaps, right? So what we're going to do is an action plan. You're going to agree, okay, I may marry you, but if I marry you, we're in the 21st century, there's going to be a prenup, okay? So obviously we're going to have a contract and we're going to make very, very clear what is allowed and what isn't, yeah? And in this prenup, we're going to have an environmental and social action plan which says, okay, um, I'm very happy with you, but I definitely need you, for example, to hire somebody who can help with health and safety assessments, who can technical, um, whatever it may be. So you really, really make it part also of the contract. And... Um, we always also put the general environmental social um, agreements in the contract, the ENS covenants as we call them, because yes, we trust the other person, but we want to have a few things, we want to have some recourse, right? So, um, and then this is the honeymoon phase. In the beginning, everybody's happy, we've given the money, everybody's perfect. And then over time, maybe, you know, in a partnership, somebody gets a bit complacent. Maybe you're not quite happy anymore. Um, so there's some sort of monitoring. Um, we do monitoring um, mostly on an annual basis, but it can depend on the type of project. And it can be, um, it's obviously, again, it's based on trust. It's more self-declaratory. But if there's something that doesn't sound quite right, maybe you want to check a little bit deeper. Yeah? And that's what we do as well. We have reporting re uh, requirements. We have reporting templates that our clients send us and where we then check um, on certain things, and we go along the performance requirements again, which is our standard framework. And then, as with any marriage, it requires continuous work and renewal, yeah? So, you know, once in a while, you wanna see, is the system working? Are we still happy with each other? Are we talking the same language? Is everything that we had agreed in the contract, is that really being done? So you wanna make sure there is a continuous improvement uh, part to this, and, um, yeah, same way as in marriage, right? If it's not working out, what do we do? We send the lawyers, right? So, <laughs> there is, of course, um, if the contract is not complied with, it's still um, a contractual um, partnership. So, there is, of course, cases of default, but we will always, of course, work with the client. It, it hardly ever happens, to be honest, um, because obviously we've done a good due diligence in, in the beginning and we know our partner very well. Um, but... Um, there is obviously always a, a sort of uh, legal recourse. And then sometimes, you know, it may fizzle out uh, or maybe we renew our vows and there may be another investment uh, down the line. And um, this is really a partnership idea. I'm, I'm trying, of course, I was making this a little bit jokingly, but I think what's important to note is that um, it, it really is based on a partnership idea. We work together with the clients that we invest in, and, um, but we, inv we also require quite high, high standards, I would say. And um, that's sort of on the risk management side. And I think we're going to show you a little bit on the, what do we have? Yeah, what's, what's our EBRD toolbox? Mm -hmm. What kind of instruments do we have? And um, we have corporate deals. Yeah, um, we can invest directly in, in companies. And um, these are quite traditional structures, such as uh, green project finance structures that could be, you know, the financing of a wind, wind park or a solar park, something like that. It can also obviously be green corporate finance, where we give um, a loan to a company that um, is engaged in green activities and um, bonds. Of course, we also support the issuance of corporate bonds, and when they meet the respective criteria, and we're going to talk a little bit more about it, then there would be a green corporate bond. And do you want to talk about the FI instruments? Yes. Thank you, Maya. <laughs> So, yes, uh, we also have a lot of work done in the financial uh, institution side. Of course, we have our uh, green credit lines. It's also what I'm doing on a day-to-day -day basis. We have uh, dedicated green credit lines, uh, the green economy financing facilities. I'm going to talk about it later on. It's our flagship product. Uh, more than 26 countries uh, use it. and. Uh, around 130 or more partner financial institutions. So we have great experience in, in this sector. Uh, I think uh, one fifth of our green portfolio is from this kind of uh, products. We also have credit lines that are not fully green, but we can uh, include some green element, green component uh, inside. Of course, we have green bonds. And uh, as you may know, we had the first green bond issuance uh, in Greece 
fairly recently. We're going to talk about it later, but uh, I thought uh, it's worth mentioning right now. And uh, we're very proud to be part of it. And yes, we also have, uh, as part of our product, and another thing I've been working on, uh, trade finance, sustainable trade finance. We have our green trade facilitation program. We also had our annual forum last year in Athens. Um, a lot of work also being done there and a lot of participation in the, from the Greek banks. And last but not least, uh, policy dialogue. Uh, we need to help our banks uh, integrate climate risk management into their uh, business planning, into uh, risk management. Uh, we need to help them um, apply uh, standards and methodologies in their green investments in order to attract funding from investors. And uh, we need also to, to help them respond to the requirements from uh, regulators and ratings agencies. So climate corporate governance is, is going to be from now on a very, very important aspect of uh, the work we do in the financial uh, sector. And uh, yeah, integration of climate-related risks, not only physical risks, but also transition risks. This is going to be a key part of uh, the way we move forward from the use of proceeds. Now we're going to have to move to a more systemic approach. And uh, Maya, let me talk a bit uh, more about the Green Economy Financing Facilities, the GEFs. As I mentioned, this is our flagship uh, product, uh, green product in uh, financial institutions. Uh, we have, uh, this started from early 2000, uh, it was called back then CEFs, Sustainable Energy Financing Facilities, now it's called Green Economy Financing Facilities because we have incorporated also, we have expanded from energy efficiency to resource efficiency and climate uh, resilience and adaptation. The unique uh, element of this product is that it comes as a full a comprehensive package, including a, a, a holistic uh, um, approach on technical assistance. We have we engage with local experts in each country that we develop a credit line, uh, marketing experts, uh, experts, engineers, <coughs> financial experts, in order to help our partner financial institutions develop a product that suits their their needs, but also the the needs of the country and the market, and. Uh, we invest a lot in capacity building, awareness raising campaigns. Sometimes in order to address market barriers, we need to have the, have the help of our uh, donors uh, to include the concessionality that is later on passed uh, to the sub borrowers and also sometimes even invest in incentive grants because you know, green technologies are not affordable everywhere. People don't know the benefits not only the financial benefits to their business, but also social benefits, improved life quality, inclusion, etc. So the GEF model, unfortunately, we don't have yet one in Greece. Maybe it's time to reconsider, but uh, uh, it's- If you're interested, you can call the meeting. <laughs> we'll set it up. But yes, it's uh, something that has been, it's, it's, it's a proven product. It's been working well. And uh, we have uh, developed, uh, we have vast experience and we can share it, we're happy to share it. And we're looking forward to, to more opportunities. And I will let you talk about bonds because I know you've been working a lot on them. That's right, yes. So um, EBRD were involved with green bonds, I would say on three ways. So firstly, we issue them ourselves as, um, as our, through our treasury department. We were last year, I think it was worldwide, even the first uh, climate resilience bonds that we issued yes. as EBRD. Um, then the second thing that we do is we help our clients issue green bonds. So especially um, when they still not quite sure what's the right framework for a green bond, what are the principles that we should be adopting, what should count, what should not count. We help them sort of on the conceptual side of that. And then the third way is we obviously invest in them. So we. Um, um, subscribe to green bonds and um, 
Yes, you've just mentioned. Um, I think that was an important transaction in the Greek market that we did last week. Um, the National Bank of Greece, MBG, came out with the first green bond by a Greek um, financial institution. It was a 500 uh, year, million euro issuance, and we have supported it with 50 million, I believe. And um, yeah, we think it's a, it's a, it's a very imp impactful way of channeling green or channeling resources to, to green to green ends, no, to green needs. So um, how do we do that? We, um, we're obviously quite strict. So when we say green bond, we really mean that. Um, we have our own ENS framework for green bonds, which is internal, but we use it for us as the, as the standard internally, um, what the ESG work on a green bond should be, and also what we expect from the client to do. Um, and then we follow the, um, the green bond principles from the International Capital Markets Association. And if it's a green bond that we subscribe to, we will expect the client um, to subscribe also to those principles and apply them. So I would say, yeah, that's uh, largely it. We have um, green bonds, of course, that we help, um, that we support and that we subscribe to both from the corporate side where companies issue those. Um, I think the Terna bond was one here in Greece last year. Um, and also from financial institutions like the NBG bond that we've just mentioned. Yeah, um, digitalization, you've mentioned it before. Um, we've been yes. heavily active on digitalization as well. Of course, now with the COVID crisis, we've all acutely noticed the need now for this. Um, so um, maybe you can show yours and then I show mine. Yes. <laughs> Well, I forgot to mention that, uh, you know, uh, to quote the words of uh, our acting president, uh, our new strategy is going to be green, equal and digital. So we will invest heavily in uh, digital tools, innovations, online innovation and platforms like the one I will present now. So the green technology selector, uh, it, it started as a need to, to help our PFIs assess PFIs. Partner financial institutions. Partner financial institutions. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm still used to the EBRD lingo. So. Yeah, that happens to all of us. So what, what happened? We had this green economy financing facilities and uh, our target group is SMEs, is households. A lot of small uh, investments, a lot of, uh, a lot of things to assess. So you, with the help of uh, local uh, consultants, engineers, we, we developed lists, offline lists of products that uh, uh, on the country context, uh, offer uh, significant savings, at least 20% above the market baseline. And uh, after the years passed, we realized that we cannot constantly be updating this offline list. We need to find a way to create a platform that is uh, driven by the market, it's self-sustainable. So we came up with uh, the idea of the Green Technology Selector, an online platform that brings together uh, households, businesses with vendors and manufacturers. So how it works, it's, a, it's an open platform. You can see the, the link uh, down on the left if you want to check it out. It's also now recently, uh, it was, we developed an, a mobile app for, uh, for both Android and, uh, and iPhones. So what it does is uh, as a vendor, as a manufacturer, you can register your product online. It's free, completely free. And uh, based on a list of uh, minimum performance criteria, your, your uh, product will be shown for a specific range of countries, depending on the country level. So for example, we do not have the same criteria for a country in Central Asia that is less developed uh, compared to a country in the European Union. So everything that we have there is uh, based on the country context. And uh, this tool has helped us in uh, accelerating and scaling up green finance through the green economy financing facilities. Also raising awareness because people can log in and see the product. They can see in every category the, the characteristics and can compare products, not by price, but actually by the efficiency and, and the, the savings they can obtain. And uh, yeah, and this is a tool, it's an eligibility tool. And as I mentioned earlier, the policy landscape is evolving. There are regulations coming up. We have the EU taxonomy. Everything we have here 
is aligned with EU taxonomy. So for uh, financial institutions that want to use this as, a, as an easy check also for trade finance to see what kind of products from their portfolio are green, it's a great way, it's a very easy way to use this and to instantly understand how much of their portfolio is actually green. And there, there is a lot of work done in the back end, a lot of experts, engineers have been involved, so it's a very robust methodology. And I will show you a few screenshots because it, it's easier to visualize if you, if you look uh, at the, on, on the left, you can see we have different categories uh, from uh, residential applications to more uh, commercial ones, in industrial uh, machinery. We present only off-the-shelf products, so usually we have a cap of around 300,000 euros on the equipment that we can list, because usually these are uh, standardized products, so ranging from uh, uh, home uh, house boilers to windows, insulation material, tractors, uh, irrigation, greenhouses, uh, uh, water extractors, anything you can imagine. And by clicking on each product, you can see also how many vendors in the country have the product, so you can uh, purchase. And you can also print or email an eligibility certificate to your financial institution to your loan officers to, to say, look, this is what I'm gonna buy. And automatically the assessment process is done in seconds. That's, that's it in a nutshell. I would encourage everyone to log in for, to see for themselves. It's uh, truly a work that's been going on for many years and we're quite proud of it. And uh, we think uh, we can also launch it in, in Greece very soon. Off to you. Yeah, yeah, it's a great tool. And I think I have another great tool. And I want to give a quick shout out here to Michael on this one because uh, Global Sustain is our um, expert consultant who's developing this with us. Um, we are trying, you remember the marriage I talked about? We're trying to digitalize it, yeah? So we're, uh, we're developing right now an environmental social management system um, that we're going to provide um, for free to our financial institution clients and also private equity funds. And it's basically in one uh, user-friendly app, um, you have all the different steps um, that you would want to undertake when you screen and when you uh, do your environmental social due diligence for an investment. So it will include the step of screening them. So for example, if it's uh, with EBRD's money, then of course you have certain exclusion lists that we uh, ask you to fulfill, or you may have your own exclusion list. Most most financial institutions do have certain sector exclusions nowadays, um, so this tool will allow you to very quickly um, do a click and check and see um, whether any of the exclusions are triggered. It will then allow you to do a quick um, categorization um, in terms of environmental and social risk level of, your, um, of the economic activity that you're thinking of financing. Um, it functions by NACE code, so you will enter the NACE code and it will tell you very rough uh, without knowing obviously the, the exact um, details of the investment, but it will tell you whether it's by subsector a low risk or a medium risk or a high risk investment. And that will help you to then decide how you're going to design the, the process for due diligence. The more high risk, of course, you want to do more work. No? Um, then the system has actually the actual environmental social due diligence tool. So it's you can think of it like a questionnaire in a digitalized way where you can answer questions on your um, potential investment. And since we also know that not all investments are the same, we are going to provide three options, um, especially on the, on the, for, for the version that is for larger banks, where you have different um, lists, so to speak, or different levels of data or deep uh, different depth of data, so to speak, whether it's a large project finance deal or a larger corporate deal, or whether it's maybe only an, an SME lending um, where less data is maybe required, less risk is being run. Um, this whole system then also generates uh, an environmental and social action plan. There are some um, recommendations that the system will give you, um, depending on the answers that you've given in the due diligence part. But you can also then add your own or remove them or you can sort of adapt it to your own needs because as we all know at the end of the day you will always go out to your client and negotiate a little bit what the action plan looks like or what the improvement measures should look like and we wanted you to have that um, adaptability that you can then manually add it but still save it in the system then of course you can um, download 
the report from your due diligence. Um, it's sort of a PDF file um, that you can then, I don't know, share with your investment committee or whoever needs, uh, needs the access to that information. And um, we will also give you, when you run this for a certain period of time, it will also generate for you like a very rough heat map of how many investments you have um, in the lower, medium or higher risk uh, levels. And um, just to say, of course, the tool is fully aligned with our EBRD requirements. Um, so since we're giving this to our client, we wanted to make sure that they are confident that by using this tool, they are already in complying with um, the ENS uh, requirements as we ask them to comply with. So it's not quite done yet. Um, we should have it ready by the end of the year, I think. Um, we're hoping for a um, rollout then to the, at the start of the next year. But um, it will be available for our, all our clients. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll show you when, when it's ready. Um, yeah, how are we looking time-wise, Michael? We have a few examples for some um, projects in Greece. Do you want us to... Um, yeah. So in general, yeah, <laughs> this is getting a bit small. My eyesight is not getting better with age. Um, so in general, I think you've alluded to it now several times. We are, of course, um, very, very supportive of the um, Greek ambition, so to speak, to, to, to transform and transition your energy matrix to, to, to much greener matrix than it is today. And so we do that mainly on a deal by deal basis, but of course also as uh, Dimitris has laid out through our engagements and policy dialogue. We have our local office here in Athens that's obviously in direct contact daily with the Greek government and collaborates. And so, um, yeah, we've done a lot of things, I would say. Again, we've had lots of investments uh, here in Greece since um, now for, for now six years. Um, we have um, done a lot extra this year because of the COVID crisis. Um, we have seen that a lot of our clients needed liquidity and they needed liquidity quite fast. So we have done things, for example, um, with the um, with PPC, with the Public uh, Power Corporation, where we've given a loan um, under our response framework um, that we um, came up with because of the pandemic of 160 um, million euros. And that is going to stabilize, of course, um, the, um, the energy sector in a way, because we're trying to help uh, stabilize a, an important company, but also it has components of supporting decarbonization. Um, I've mentioned already, there was a corporate bond from Derna, um, another energy player that we've supported last year, that was 60 million. Um, we have actually a whole framework for Greek corporate bonds. So it is a more thematic approach of ours and a high priority for the Greek market um, because we also know that by supporting bonds, we're also supporting the capital markets now and the building and the stabilization and the deepening of capital markets. So it has this added value that goes beyond the individual transaction, so to speak. Um, what else should we say? Um, oh, yeah, we've looked at uh, another big issue here for Greece. Um, we've looked at non-performing loans, which is um, a business that unfortunately is on the rise now because of the COVID situation and the new crisis. Um, we found that um, it's, very in, um, it's very important to invest in non-performing loans because it does stabilize the banking sector. Um, in, in the country, for example, like here in Greece. But we also know that there's a person at the end of this chain, which is a borrower who's not able to repay their loans. And so we did want to make sure we are knowledgeable enough, enough and we understand what kind of social risks are inherent in this, um, in this business lines. And so we commissioned a study and we're now trying to come up with some very specific tools that when we invest in NPL transactions, which is usually we buy them off, um, a major financial institution and then this portfolio is being managed by a um, non-performing loan servicer. Um, we want to make sure that they have the right tools and the right process in place to really identify potential social issues and also uh, manage them adequately. Um, we should not forget to mention, you know, we mentioned already the first green bond. Yeah. There's also the Avis deal. Yes. Uh, securitization deal. Securitization. I think the, if I am not wrong, yes, 35 million from EBRD, the largest non-banking securitization in Greece. Yes. LP also. 
just on Avis, I would like to say they, th this is also an interesting project because it seems like a standard FI transaction where we just help the circularization and we buy something, but um, or we, we subscribe to the to the circularization. However, we've agreed with Avis that they will actually green their fleets to a certain exactly, extent, yes. right? So we always try and put those added components in there um, so that together with our money, we're always transferring also our green Supporting e-mobility in Greece. Yes. Uh, I For think sure. it's uh, it's gonna create a, a new wave of uh, similar transactions, hopefully in the future. Yeah. LP also. Uh, how many? Seventy-five mil, seventy-five percent EBRD invested in the bond issuance. The largest PV plant uh, that's gonna be replacing uh, the the coal plant in uh, Ptolemaida in North Greece, two hundred megawatts, I think, or maybe more. Uh, if there are many things happening in Greece right now. I think uh, it's it's a very it's a very crucial moment for the country to to set the, the basis for uh, the green recovery. Yeah, and maybe I can say also to this, um, we're we're also helping. We've also tried to help with the privatization process here in Greece in in, in greening it in a way, because you you saw um, the app that I showed you that you, we're developing for our financial institution clients. Well. You will know that this was actually, we had this idea and this all actually came because we were contacted by the Greek privatization fund HRADF last year and they said, look, we have all these infrastructure assets that we're going to um, privatize, but we would like to measure the ENS performance of those assets, not only the financial performance. And so the first prototype of the app that we're now doing for all our clients was actually uh, an app that we did for HRADF or with HRADF together, with, which they are now using to evaluate ENS value of their assets. So um, something, um, I think this is also a good example for our approach. We often pilot something on one client, one country, and then because we have all those uh, countries of operation and we have actually quite a broad and diverse reach, uh, we, we then think, oh, this is this looked really well, and we got really uh, good feedback, and it functioned very well. So we're going to do it bigger and, and roll it out across uh, many other countries as well. Yeah, and for the end, uh, I left uh, the TFP, the green TFP. Yeah. Because if we want to make uh, Greece greener, we need to import some of these technologies and trade finance. Uh, the trade facilitation program helps with guarantees. And uh, in, in Greece, our banks are very active. You can see the share of the portfolio from 2018. Of course, now this year, green was not a priority, but uh, judging by the new transactions and the efforts done to green the energy sector, I think we're gonna be looking at many examples like the one on the right side of the screen. Yeah. So uh, I think uh, I'm very optimistic about Greece in terms of uh, becoming one of the pioneers in, uh, in, in, in achieving the targets set by the Paris Agreement. Yeah. Now that, I think, is, concludes our presentation. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, both. Uh, and uh, I'm glad we saved like uh, 15 minutes for, uh, for some q and I have like a dozen questions here, but let me start with some uh, some easy ones. Uh, Dimitri, you mentioned about climate corporate governance, right? Yes. And one of the frameworks that's been out in the market now is the TCFD, the Task Force for Climate Financial Related Disclosures. I've heard someone that you're committed to publish your first report as a, as, as a bank. And um, as your department is also in, in this field, I think, uh, a comment on how you, you envision TCFD or climate in general, climate corporate governance in a, in a financial institution, but also are you working with clients on this uh, front? That's a very good question. Um, it's something that is certainly uh, troubling us, how we're going to do it. It's very new for us also. We are working on it. There's many people working on it right now. Uh, people from my team also. I don't have a definite answer for you now, but maybe we, if we speak in uh, two or three months' time, I'll be able to tell you more. Uh, as soon as we have the strategy approved, I think now we have the endorsement of our shareholders to proceed. So this is going to be a top priority. We are still trying to figure out what is the best way to do so, but definitely it's something that uh, we need our banks, uh, we need to support our banks with. And uh, I know that there's a lot of questions everywhere 
what is the TCFT, how are we supposed to report, what are we supposed to disclose. Not to mention the taxonomy, right? The because taxonomy, the taxonomy is also the you need to provide technical cooperation to your client. Yeah, regarding the taxonomy, of course, we, we have a member of our team that is actually the technical expert group. So we are following uh, up, uh, especially because it's constantly being updated. And that's why we try to keep all our tools aligned with the EU taxonomy. And uh, as far as I know, the EU taxonomy, the plan is to make it global, not only EU-wide, but uh, more and more uh, mm -hmm. countries will adopt it. So with the international platform exactly. for sustainable finance. Well, what we are doing on, on TCFD is um, we have our internal pilot to really figure out how we can integrate the recommendations on our own portfolio. Um, we do work with clients um, that are interested in it. Um, you've also mentioned the Climate Action Network for financial institutions. Yes. Well, we're trying yeah. to talk to our peers and trying to together come, come up with, okay, what's the best way to, to actually implementing the, the, the TCFD recommendations. And um, it's a work in progress, yes, yeah, as, as, uh, as you said, but. Yeah, Maya, there's a question. Uh, what is the divorce rate of EBRD transactions? <laughs> so do actually, very low. Uh, We're yeah. very um, do, do actually uh, transactions and loans default because of environmental and social issues? Is is it like a okay? It is not. It. Um, I've only been with EBRD for two years, and in my, on the portfolio that I've been looking at, it has not happened. Um, I think we avoid this because we engage early. So we, usually we don't get that far to the bottom. Because of the reporting, right, also monitoring. It. Everything. Um, I think during the due diligence process, we're very, very clear what we expect from them. We explain very well what we need. We also make very sure that they know what they need to do um, in specific markets where, um, and you know this because you've also helped us with this at times, um, in specific markets where we know that it's still, the capacities are maybe a little bit lower, we use technical cooperation and we, for example, um, send international consultants to help clients, banks, for example, to set up their environmental social management systems from the beginning in a way that is compliant with our standards and in the way that we know they can do responsible investing in a, in a meaningful way. So I think we try to really catch early if there's a capacity issue or if there's a um, yeah, a technical holdup. If it's a commitment issue, if we feel that a potential client is just blatantly not committed to it, then I think the deal just wouldn't proceed in the first place. Mm -hmm. So the rate is very low. Yeah. Okay, and and I guess are you like in a, in a constant controversy or fight or negotiation with the bankers because the bankers are actually looking to make transactions, right? But on the other side. You want to safeguard that environmental and social governance out there, right? Yeah, no, I would. How, how easy is that? <laughs> I wouldn't say so. I think we, we speak pretty much with one voice. We have uh, very good relations with our bankers. And I think they've also understood the business case for it. I think That's we've good. evolved a lot. Because going back time. to uh, Piraeus Bank presentation earlier, it's the culture eh, yeah. that you need to change. And in the commercial banks, what, and the multilateral development banks are, are in a better shape. Eh? Absolutely, I think so. We have, I think the multilateral development banks have always a little bit framed and been sort of standard setters in a way. So I think our whole culture is like that. EBRD has in its founding mandate from 1991, it says that we're to invest only um, in a socially and environmentally responsible way. So it's been in the DNA from the first day. And I think everybody who comes to work for EBRD knows this. Um, the GET approach that uh, Dimitris has outlined, our bankers have targets. They're not only measured by their financial targets, they're also measured by how much GET, for example, they can achieve. So I think we've really... And, and there's also the, the reputational risk, right? Which of is, course. And, of we're, course. We're, and I think our bankers, as, as much as us, of course, who works on this every day, but they're very aware of the reputational risk and also of the actual physical, environmental and social risks that our investments sometimes can have. So uh, they, I think they've understood as much as our clients have also understood that it's actually value added. And so they, mm. they I think they're supportive, yeah. Uh, Dimitris, going back to you, uh, why don't we have um, the technology selector in Greece yet? Are there any companies registered? What shall we do to uh, create awareness about this thing? What are the criteria to join? Uh, there are many 
innovative companies, you know, that perhaps are interested in knowing how they can uh, leverage this tool and go to other markets? W what's your suggestion to that? I've been asking myself the same question, of course. <laughs> but the reason is, of course, uh, we, we developed this, uh, this tool to help uh, our existing projects in a different region. Therefore, the priorities were different at the time. But now we're in a stage that I can say, certainly, we need the Greek market to join the platform, to use the platform. It's going to make the life easier uh, for our other transactions, for example, in uh, green trade. It's going to be easier for us to say, oh, this is a green trade. We can offer you uh, the better product. If, we, if people use this tool, it's an eligibility tool, in a sense. So also for, uh, for exposure, it's a great, it's a global tool. Everybody can see it. How many countries of operation you are now? We have now 38. Yeah. 38 countries we have it right now available in local language too so it's a door opener exactly and it's it's very easy it's very easy to use it takes seconds if not seconds and minutes to register and uh, we are also we have launched a campaign now in china to include also chinese manufacturers so the list of products is going to grow the list of uh, vendors suppliers is going to grow and it would be a shame if Greek uh, companies, manufacturers, are not part of this. So and, and, and this is combined with your trade finance facilities, uh, that you also partner with other FIs? Yes. Actually, we've been in discussions with uh, major groups like uh, uh, Citibank, uh, JP Morgan. They want to use this tool. So they have clients from other countries. So we need to make this tool, tool more known. We need to have more people engaged. And now with the mobile app, I think it's even, it can be even more widespread. It, it's, uh, it's, uh, I'm saying because I, I've worked a lot on it and the model, the, it's very robust. Uh, it's uh, a lot of uh, people have been working on making it uh, a tool that is aligned with standards out there, taxonomies. The minimum performance criteria that we have set are uh, are only allowing the best available technologies to be shown online. So I can say with safety that it's a tool that consumers can trust in order to, to get the, the best available equipment available in their market. Okay. Um, and it helps us as investors to very clearly know is this green or not without taking all the guessing work out so we avoid greenwashing we can support those deals for example under trade finance because we immediately know it's a yes or a no if the trade is on a good that comes off the technology list we can straight away um, consider it as a green mm -hmm. trade finance for example mm -hmm. but it doesn't have to be only trade finance that could also go under SME yes, gas, everything, everything all our lending lines right yeah talking about SME I, uh, I guess you heard uh, Athena Hadzipetru the chair of uh, the Hellenic Development Bank that 97 98 percent of the businesses in Greece are yes. SMEs and not only in Greece in uh, the whole European Union mm -hmm. And uh, you want to tell us a little bit about your program you have about supporting uh, the, the, the SMEs? And uh, we just did our first, uh, our first deal as Global Sustain, one of uh, the uh, con uh, verified consultants of EBRD in, in Greece uh, uh, under this uh, ASB. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so we, of course, we uh, SMEs are a strong um, priority for us. We know that they're really the backbone of the economy in many of our countries of operation, so we do support them. We have the, um, the a special program for SMEs whereby... Um, Advice for small business. Yeah, whereby exactly we extend financing, but more, maybe more importantly, we extend knowledge. We extend advice, advisory services, and um, we, we see what the gap is. There could be legal, it could be operational, it could be sustainability, strategy. Um, and so SMEs can, can come to us, they can apply, and then they can be matched with a consultant, for example, that helps them to bridge that gap. And that is a win-win because the company gets better, the SME becomes better, and for us it's a better partner to invest in because we know that they have robust uh, systems in place. Mm, so it's yeah. a win-win. Absolutely. Uh, and another question uh, there is about the levels of uh, environmental social risks because you operate in so many uh, economies of operation uh, how do you negotiate environmental social risks per countries or developed countries developing uh, emerging 
um, you have like local experts. So how do you do that? How do you like select uh, uh, the, uh, and, and um, uh, assign the, the appropriate level of risk? And you can be tolerant to social risk, for example, in Greece or Ukraine or Turkey or Egypt. Yeah, so for direct financing, we really assess it on a one by one basis. For every single project, we do the full environmental social risk assessment along the 10 uh, performance requirements as applicable. I mean, if there's no resettlement, then obviously the performance requirement for resettlement is not triggered. But um, other than that, we go religiously through this list of topics. We work, of course, a lot with external um, consultants that help us with the technical assessment of things. There's often very specific things for a wind farm. We may need a bird and bat assessment, which is very specific. So, of course, we hire um, experts for that. And we will also always have a third party or an external expert to, as a checks and balances to our own assessment of an investment. So, we always get, especially on the high risk investments, we always get um, external independent experts that give us their independent opinion. And then we obviously consider that and, and, and put that into our, uh, for example, environmental social action plans and so on. Um, for, for intermediate financing, we want to train or we delegate that to the financial institutions. So we help them to be ready to do that estimation themselves. And we procure for that by obviously explaining to them how we measure risk and what the different levels are, but we also make sure that they have procedures in place that are commensurate with that risk. So an FI in an EU market that only invests in small SME loans, they obviously, we have less require, we have the same requirements, but we need less intensity or less work done by them than maybe a financial institution that invests in large, in large scale infrastructure product in a, country that's outside of the European Union. So now we, we really, um, it's, it's one by one. Um, mm -hmm. We have, of course, a lot of local knowledge because we have an EBRD office in every country that we operate in. So our colleagues that are actually in the countries, they know the countries very well and they can pinpoint us in the right directions. They, they are very, very, um, of course, involved. They know what's going on, what, how the regulations are changing, what the political priorities are, what the general maybe cultural issues are, what are historical issues and so on. So I think we have quite a fluid way of bringing all this together and, and you know, putting that into a, into a deal. Uh, Dimitri, going back to you, Green Cities program. Very sad that no Greek city is in the program. <laughs> I, I, I hope it is the same for you as a fellow Greek. What does it take to become a green city? How shall we like invite uh, big cities of Greece to uh, enroll to your program? And what will they benefit from that? What, what projects do you finance through uh, Green Cities program? I think, uh, yes, uh, regarding the why Greece is not there, why not the Greek city is still not there, I, I have to ask my colleagues, honestly, there is a separate group of people working there. But uh, what is the benefit? Uh, it's working, uh, making decisions at the municipal level, it's far more effective than at the state level. That's why it has proven as a very successful model. Um, the benefits of what we do, we help them design an action plan. So we have this CCAPS, Green City Action Plan, that helps the city decide uh, what is the best policy for uh, e-mobility, for example, uh, for uh, improving infra infrastructure and uh, making the uh, the life easier for their people. Uh, in Tirana, in Albania, the, the Green City Action Plan will help the, the city design a green zone, like a green ring around the city. So things like that, simple solutions, but with the help of experts that uh, sometimes uh, it's, it's needed to help uh, make decisions faster and uh, make the right decisions. So coming back to why not Greece yet, if any city so far, we, we focus on uh, capitals or uh, at least uh, the second biggest city of a country, mm. if I'm not wrong. So maybe the city should apply. Yeah, we'll make sure we notify them promptly about this, um, uh, this program. Yeah, we should maybe do a call for action. Um, <laughs> come to us, we would love to work with you. <laughs> so how actually one comes to you for collaboration? So of course, the first point of contact for most of our clients is our local office. Um, uh, Andrea Moraru is our head for our director for Greece and Cyprus, and she's here. She's in Athens. Uh, we have an office here in, in the center of Athens. So um, 
you can always come to us. The doors are open. I, well, the office is probably not open right now, actually. But um, the virtual doors are wide open. So uh, you can obviously come in touch with us either way. But um, and, and then in London, we have very big teams, uh, thankfully, um, that work on those different technical areas, whether it's ESG, risk management, whether it's climate integration, whether it's climate risk management, all of those things. So we will have certainly a conversation and see what the needs are, and then we will find the right people. Right. And a final question for you. Um, I would like you, I would like each one of you please to, to name what is the biggest environmental, social and governance risk based on your uh, capacity in, in the bank. So if I would tell you to all these corporations that are, are watching us, what is the number one environmental risk? No matter the sector, no matter the country, no matter the industry, the size of the business, the, the geographical impact, no matter what. If you would select one single risk in environment and social and governance in each one of these pillars, where would that be? I guess it's got to be climate now. Um, definitely, I would say for me, it's definitely climate. And for social? Because it encompasses the social and the governance also, because um, climate is an environmental risk, but the social impacts are massive. Mm. So I think I would say climate for all three. I mean, look at what happened in Greece now a few weeks ago. We had the hurricane in Greece. I think yes. it's a unique phenomenon. People's yeah. houses Cycling. were destroyed. Yeah. Cycling. Yeah, yeah. So the impact of this extreme weather events is still unknown, at least in this part of the world. Mm. Well, I would thank, thank you very, very much uh, for this uh, wonderful presentation you gave us in the discussion. Uh, we're looking forward to making this uh, 3.8 billion that you have invested so far, <laughs> at least another 10 uh, for the years uh, to come and uh, supporting uh, the Greek economy, uh, the Greek banking system and uh, the, the, the corporates. Thank you so much for Thanks your for having us. Thank you very much. contribution. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, after uh, almost uh, eight hours, we've come to the conclusion of uh, the forum. Uh, I would like to uh, thank you all for your patience, for your participation uh, in this uh, first Digital Sustainability Forum. Uh, before uh, I would like to, uh, before closing, I would like to thank once again uh, our sponsors and uh, going in. Uh, um, uh, first, uh, the gold sponsors, uh, Gilead, uh, Piraeus Group, and uh, Papastratos. Then I would like also to thank our silver sponsors, uh, the Otec Group, Cosmote, Inter-American, and Nestle. Uh, our supporters, uh, Alpha Bank, uh, European Alliance, Elas Gold, and uh, Hellenic Petroleum, as well as Henkel, the Gia Group, uh, PPC Renewables, and Quest Holdings. Uh, also, I would like to thank uh, Signify, Eureka, Papadopoulos, and uh, Cisco which are uh, technology partners and Webex. Uh, our COVID Shield partner for this uh, event, uh, Tu Vostre Alas, our health and safety partner, uh, YEP Group, uh, our digital partner, Generation Y, and our digital platform partner, LiveOn, uh, with the application that we use today for the broadcasting of this uh, uh, event. Uh, our coffee sponsor, Nespresso, uh, our uh, beer sponsor, Athenian Brewery, looking forward to some beers after that. And Gansia, our uh, uh, cocktail sponsor, um, and uh, we'd also like to thank uh, our, all our uh, communication partners and uh, institutional partners. Uh, it's been a very hard task, yet challenging for us to deliver this uh, forum. Uh, I would like to um, uh, request, please, to submit us uh, your evaluation uh, form, which is going to be sent electronically via the uh, live on uh, platform uh, over the next uh, days. Uh, Another thing is that we're collecting now the final versions of all uh, the presentations that you saw, all the material of our sponsors and all the videos and the resources that uh, uh, were presented in this uh, forum today. And we're going to uh, distribute that through the electronic uh, bag uh, after the event. All the information will be uh, there. Uh, we've already started planning uh, the next year's forum and it's definitely going to be digital and uh, physical again, provided uh, the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, uh, how it's going to be developed. And uh, we also would like to uh, notify you that we're going to have uh, another e ESG sustainable finance event uh, virtual on uh, November 10th. Uh, you're going to receive uh, more information about that in the next uh, following days. 
Uh, if you're interested in partnering with us on our sustainability forum or other capacity building and training uh, efforts and initiatives, feel free to reach us. You find all the information you need on our portal, sustainabilityforum.gr and globalsustain.org. Uh, again, thank you very much for your participation. Again, thank all our sponsors, uh, our wonderful team at Global Sustain that really helped put this together, uh, the Seabrexis team crew uh, that help us uh, with this uh, um, uh, forum this year and uh, our partners now and from now on and live on for uh, hosting this event at the platform. Thank you so much and looking forward to seeing you next year.